So let's do 7.3, creating rules to define sequences. If a sequence is arithmetic or geometric, a general term can always be found because arithmetic and geometric sequences follow a predictable pattern. For any other type of sequence, it is not always possible to find a general term. So as you can see below, I have three examples here. Um, I'm going to start actually with B and then with C. Now, obviously, these sequences can follow arithmetic, some sort of geometric pattern, or something else that you can probably find the general term formula for. So if we look at um, question B first, if we take a look at these numbers, it goes from 1 to 3 to 9. It looks like the next number would be 27. And the reason for that is that it clearly looks like there is a common ratio of 3 you are multiplying by 3 in order to get to the next number. So there's a common ratio of 3. So the ratio is 3. The first term, A, is 1. So since this is a geometric sequence, we can obviously use the geometric general term formula, which is Tn equals A times R to the n minus 1, and we can write in, substitute these values in there. So the general term formula would just be A, which is 1, R is 3, and minus 1. Uh, obviously, we do not have to write the 1 out here, because 1 times anything is itself. So this is 3 to the n minus 1. And we can use this formula in order to find any term that we wish. Uh, again, according to the lessons that we've done in class, we would always use the general term formula to find something like term number 9. We wouldn't carry out this pattern 9 times and then circle the ninth term because clearly you wouldn't do that for term 900. So we do term 900 the same way as we do term 9. We always use the general term formula. Let's move on to question C here. And question C has these numbers. It says 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, and so forth. And um, after looking at this for a little while, you would notice that um, the first term could actually be written as 1 over 1. That's uh, a little bit of a giveaway because the first term is 1 over 1, the second term is 1 over 2, the third term 1 over 3. So it looks like the fourth term is going to be 1 over 4, and the fifth term will be 1 over 5, and so forth. It just looks like whatever the term number is, the bottom number changes according to what the term number is. The top number always stays the same. So, of course, if we had to find term number 100, I would, it would be safe to assume that it would be 1 over 100. Now, there is no rule for this sequence um, because obviously it's not arithmetic to go from 1 to a half. You're just subtracting a half, and then if you subtract a half again, it's not a third. There's also not a uh, geometric pattern because you can't go from one to a half. Uh, to go from one to a half, you multiply by a half. Then if you multiply this by a half, it's not one third. It's actually a quarter. So it's not geometric or arithmetic. So if you want to come up with a general term formula, there could be another pattern happening. The pattern that we've seen happening here, whatever the term number is, that's the bottom number. So to find any term number, it's always one at the top. And on the bottom, it's whatever the term number is. So this would be the formula for that general term, 1 over n. So again, term 5 would be 1 over 5. Term 6 would be 1 over 6 and so forth. So sometimes it doesn't follow a geometric or arithmetic pattern. And if we take a look at this one here, this is the hardest of all of them. Um, so you have 0, 3, 8, and 15. I'm just going to rewrite this over here. So we have 0, 3, 8, 15, and then what's the next number? Um, if we look at this, it's not arithmetic, because in order to go from here to here, you're adding 3. You add 3 again, it's not 8, it's 6. So clearly not arithmetic. It's not geometric either, because 0 times anything is 0, so they're not going to give you 3. Um, so what is the pattern here? Well, after looking at this for a little while, I started noticing that this thing was at actually a parabola because if we take a look at the differences, you add 3, then you add 5, and then you add 7. 
So it looks like you're adding by more each time. So you add three the first time, then you add five, then you add seven. It's safe to say that the next time you're going to be adding nine. So the next number should actually be 24. And then you would be adding two more than that, which is 11. And so you get 35 and so forth. The reason why I say it's a parabola is because the second differences are all two. And we know that looking at finite differences, if the second differences are the same, it is a parabolic shape. So how do we come up with this formula? Well, if I stick this into a table of values, okay, and I have what the term number is equal to and what's the term number. Term number one is equal to three. Now I'm writing it down here on purpose. Term number two is equal to, sorry, term number one was equal to zero. Term number two is equal to three. Term number three, the third term, is eight. The fourth term is 15 and so forth. Okay, so again, the first term is zero. The second term is three. The third term is eight. The fourth term is 15. So if we look at this in terms of finite differences, in order to go to the next number here, you have to add three, <clears throat> then you have to add five, then you have to add seven, and that's how the pattern worked. Um, clearly, if we want to find term five, you know, you're always adding two to this. So instead of adding three, now you're adding five, then you're adding seven. So the next number, you have to add nine. And so that was why this is 24. It's because the second differences are all two. They're all two. Those are increasing by two. The first differences are increasing by two. Now, this is a parabola. The only problem here is we have to come up with a formula for this parabola. Now, what's the formula for a parabola? Well, we have the formula that's in standard form, which is virtually impossible to come up with using these this table of values, or vertex form or x-intercept form. If we used vertex form, y equals a x minus h squared plus k, the only thing that we'd have to figure out is where the vertex is. Otherwise, if we wanted to use the other form, which is y equals a x minus the first x-intercept and x minus the second x-intercept, we can use that form as well, but we'd have to figure out where both x-intercepts are. So coming back to this, I don't really know what anything is. Now, x-intercepts, remember, these are your x's and these are your y's. X-intercept always happen when y is 0. Well, y is 0 right there. So we do know, actually, that one of the x-intercepts is 1. But we don't know where the other x-intercepts are. Um, we also don't know where the vertex is. We're going to have to work backwards here and figure out what the previous terms would be. Now, clearly, always when you start a sequence, um, this is term 1. There's no such thing as term 0 and term negative 1 and stuff. But in terms of coming up with a formula, it does make sense to work backwards here just so we can figure out where the vertex is. So if we just pretended that there was a term 0 and a term negative 1 and a term negative 2, what would those terms be equal to? Now, looking at our pattern here, these are increasing by 2. Remember, in order to go backwards here, you do the opposite operation. 24 minus 9 would give me 15. Minus 7 would give me 8. Minus 5 would give me 3. Minus 3 would give me 0. Um, so how do you go from the last one to this? See, this is 9, 7, 5, 3. The next number up here should be only a 1, a plus 1, because it should be 2 less. This is always 2 less, 2 less, 2 less, 2 less. So what should this number over here be according to this? Again, subtract 5, subtract 3. This would be subtract 1. So this technically would be negative 1 over here. Okay, and then again, how do we get to the next number here? Again, these numbers are all moving down by 2. So this is 9, 7, 5, 3, minus 2 is another 1, minus 2. This should be negative 1. And now you ask yourself the question, okay, to go backwards, so what should this number be here? To go backwards, you subtract 9, the opposite of this. Subtract 7, subtract 5, subtract 3, subtract 1. So this would be add 1. That should be 0. 
right? Because zero minus one is negative one, add one is zero, add three is that, and so forth. And again, in order to go up another one, again, these are all going down by two. So nine, seven, five, three, one, subtract two is negative one, subtract another two, this is negative three. What should this number be over here? Again, in order to go backwards, subtract five, subtract three, subtract one, add one, this should be add three. So this term should be negative two, three. Again, this makes sense because three minus three is zero, minus one is negative one, plus one is zero, and so forth. See, this is actually okay. Now we are actually, with this information, we could use either one of these formulas because I know both x-intercepts. X-intercepts happen when y is zero. So there's one x-intercept, there's a second x-intercept. So feel free to use this equation. But I'm actually gonna use the vertex formula because we also know where the vertex is. The vertex is the turning point. The turning point would be this point right here because we know a parabola is symmetrical. So on the x-axis, uh, on the equation of the um, right in the middle, and so the vertex would be this because on both sides it's perfectly symmetrical. Zero, zero, three, three, this is eight, so that would be an eight, 15, 15, and so forth. Now these numbers obviously do not make sense in terms of our sequence, but we did this so that we can figure out where our vertex was. Clearly in a sequence, that's term one, term two, term three. There's no such thing as term zero, term negative one, and so forth. But for the sake of the theory of coming up with this formula, that's what we've done. So now that we know the vertex is zero, negative one, hk, so that's my hk. So again, the vertex is zero, negative one, and that's my h, and that's my k. I can plug this in here. So I have y equals a x minus my h is zero, and my k is actually, sorry, is negative one. So that's my formula so far. So I get y equals a x minus zero is just x squared minus one. So this is almost my formula. <clears throat> the only thing I have to find now is my a value. So how do you go to find your a value? Well, you need another point. So what other point would you like to use? It doesn't matter which point you use. You can use any of these points. I will use the point, just a random one, two, three. So if I use the point two, three, I know that x is two and y is three. So y is three, x is two. So if I plug this in here, y is three, and x is two, I can come up with the formula now. So this is gonna be three equals, uh, this is two squared, which is four times a is four a minus one. Continuing that, bringing the negative one to the other side, this will be three plus one equals four a. And so four is equal to four a. Continuing this over here, I'm gonna get four is equal to four a. To get rid of this four on this side, I'm gonna divide out the four. And so a is equal to one. So actually a is just one. So if I want to find, write the proper formula, it's just going to be y equals a is one, x squared minus one. And obviously I don't have to write the one in front of the x squared, so it's just going to be x squared minus one. Maybe some of you could have come up with this formula by using guess and check. But when the table of values is going to be a little more difficult, you're gonna to have to use this method. So now instead of writing y's and x's, we should actually be writing t at n and n's. So this should actually be t at n equals n squared minus one. That is how we're gonna find any term number. And you can test it out. For instance, term number four is 15. So if I plugged in four, this will be four squared, which is 16 minus one is 15. Okay, so term number four would work out. And you can test that for anything. So that's how you come up with the form, uh, general term formula, for something that is geometric.